Um, good morning, guys. We're going to be talking about steering system today, and I've got here on the screen a picture of what they call a parallelogram steering system, or what, what you would call a more conventional steering system, where you have a recirculating ball steering gear, and you have a drag link and inner and outer tie rod ends, etc. Here's a rack and pinion steering system, which would be, you could argue, is really the convention today and has been for 25 years, um, where you have a, a rack assembly here with an outer tie rod and outer tie rod. In. Obviously, this one is a lot more components, and we consider it stronger. This one's considered more compact and weaker. But let's talk about a purpose of a steering system. So the first purpose of a steering system is to give us directional control so that we can decide where the car is going to go as we turn it uh, down the road. Second one is stability. We want it to go in the direction that we have asked it to go, but we want it to go with stability. We don't want it wandering. We don't want it unsafe, et cetera. So I'm grabbing, as you can't see me here, but I'm grabbing a steering column here. Give us some steering control. You can see it right there. I've got a steering column with the airbag out. And it's got all of its components on it. So here's, it's got a, uh, it's got a U joint here, and it's got a breakaway joint there for in case of an accident, and all of its electronics, etc. So let's keep going here. Third purpose would be safe handling. So we want it to, and stability and safe handling obviously go together. Um, we want the cars we're going down the road to. Go where we want it to go. We want it to be stable and not to be wandering. We don't want to put into us uh, put us into an unsafe situation. The goals of a steering system are go like this. So the first thing is we want the vehicle to go straight, obviously, and we want it to have no dive or wander. So dive is I let go of the steering wheel and poof, it's going for the ditch. Wander is I let go of the steering wheel and it just slowly starts to move off the road in let's say a hundred feet or well actually should say a little more than that, but several hundred feet, it starts to, to uh, wander off the road. Our second goal is that the steering wheel stays straight when we're going straight. And they, you say, well, that seems kind of simple, but, but that's an indicator if the steering wheel is not straight and we have to hold it off, that's an indicator we've got some sort of misalignment issue. So our goals are we want the vehicle to go straight, no diver wonder. We want the steering wheel to stay straight. And we want minimal steering effort. We don't have to fight the car when we're trying to steer it. We like the idea of um, when we go to park, it's fairly easy to maneuver. But when we're going fast, we want it to be fairly stable. We don't want them to have a little input take us off the road. So that's why most all the modern cars have variable assist steering. So you get less assist at high speed and more assist at low speed, let's say when you're parking or manipulating in a parking lot or something like that. So there's a couple ways that we can classify systems. We can classify systems as power or non-power or mechanical and electronic. Okay, so power assist or no power assist, mechanical or electronic. So we do have a, and this is elect, not electronic steering, but electronic assist. Um, there is no drive-by wire steering yet. In other words, where all, when I turn a steering wheel, all I'm doing is, let's say, turning a variable resistor and the car takes over. We don't have that yet. Now, if there's a self-driving car that has it, I'm unaware of it. But there is no um, car sold right now in America that I know of that actually has that feature. So, so that's how we talk about them. And when we're talking about, we're talking about assist, whether it's power or non-power. So we can classify them this way. But we can also talk about different types of system, and that's number four. Conventional, which is what we call recirculating ball steering box. This is the inside of a recirculating ball steering gear. Or rack and pinion, which you can see right here. And I'm going to go ahead and grab a couple and bring them over. So what we have down here on the table is here is a recirculating ball steering gear. This would be what we call a conventional style steering system. It would be considered old school. It would be considered mostly on trucks now. It would be considered more heavy duty and stronger than, than a rack and pinion system. Over here, let me grab the camera and move it over here. I've got a, a rack and pinion unit right here. It's a power rack and pinion unit, and I can tell that because I can see two hydraulic lines that would go inside here. 
and then the hydraulic line sending on both sides of the rack. I've got an inner joint here with a bellows boot, and an outer U joint, or tie rod in there. Inner joint here, we call it inner socket, with a bellows boot and an outer tie rod in there. And there's our lock nut, so we can adjust this, sorry, adjust this rod here for adjusting toe, which is one of our alignment angles. There's the pinion coming down. This one here is a rack taken apart. You can actually see the teeth of the rack that the pinion rolls on. I've got the pinion out of this one that would look down inside there. And as it spins, this is a pinion here, it's got teeth down inside here that roll on these rack teeth. And then finally what I've got over here is, here's a brand new uh, electric motor assist power rack unit. So this is an electric motor assist power rack unit. It's kind of interesting. You notice the size of the tube over here on this rack. This one's even thinner. It's even a thinner um, unit. You can see where it mounts there and it mounts back there. But the electric motor is pretty large and it does take a fair amount of current. So you'll see these with um, I think over 180 to 120 amps flowing to that motor. So it's pretty significant. This obviously is where the steering shaft, like on this one over here, attaches to is right here on the top and this is some sort of a protector they've got on there and they've also got a, a sensor here so this is probably a steering angle sensor that works with uh, vehicle stability control to try and make the car go in the direction where you're pointing it um, and I may be wrong on that that may not be a vehicle because as I see the harness going into the motor it makes me think oh this might be um, st strictly steering position input I don't know if they use that for the steering angle sensor on variable um, vehicle stability control, but it obviously is giving some kind of indication to the motor about where we're pointing the vehicle to go. Does that make sense? And that's an electric power assist uh, steering system. Let me get this camera back to where I want it right there. Okay, there we go. Okay, so let's continue. So next is steering system components. So our general components is we have a steering wheel with or without an airbag, and that obviously makes sense. And I've got an airbag here as you're jotting that down. Um, here's an airbag out of a Miata, or sorry, a um, Toyota MR2 that a former student of mine back in like, I don't remember when it was, 2008, and I just remember because he was one of my troubleshooters. He got in an accident and deployed the airbag. He was fine. Um, and um, says on here, yeah, <laughs> yeah, he, look at he says, he's this typical high school student. Here lies the bag of the best car ever, Cyrus DeLaw. Anyways, there you go. Cyrus is a cool kid. Um, so like our column, our steering column can be collapsible, telescoping, or tilt. So our components are steering wheel with or without airbag, but these days everything has an airbag. Our column is collapsible, telescoping, or tilt. So a tilt wheel, you guys know the wheel goes trunk, 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 trunk. Telescoping can kind of come up or go down. Collapsible is where they actually fold over and think late, uh, you know, mid late 60s um, Ford T Birds and things where they, they actually collapse the steering wheel aside so you could get into the car easier. Um, a rag joint or a U joint, some sort of a joint, and we have that here. Let me grab one to show you. So here's a rag joint, which is an old school joint that connects the steering shaft that splines in there to the um, shaft going right in or bolted right into the steering gear. So this is basically a flexible joint between your steering gear here and your actual steering shaft. Let's keep going. And some have a U-joint, so you can see this one, sorry. You can see this one's got the U-joint right there on there, that little square U-joint right here. And this one's got a breakaway joint here, and that's so that in a head-on collision that shears and doesn't try and push the steering wheel and shaft up towards the driver. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. Also, we have a power steering pump, and a pump is a belt-driven steering pump to give us uh, steering assist. Um, uh, when we're driving, and um, you guys understand that. Let me just kind of correct this angle a little bit. Bring this guy over this way a little bit. Okay. 
So we've got a power steering pump and belt. And those can be a lot of a source of a lot of noise, a lot of screeching in the morning when we start up and the belt's loose or it's dry and cold, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but um, uh, you're going to see those go away more and more as you see electric assist uh, power steering. Power steering pumps, again, are not only a source of noise, but they're a source of a lot of leaks, um, a lot of fluid leaks. And so having electric power assist is kind of nice, um, kind of a nice, neat idea, probably more easily controlled as well. And, um, and of course, as the fluid gets dirty and gets aerated, meaning airs in the, in the um, fluid, it gets foamed and tends to be more you know, eh, eh, when you turn, etc. Think late 90s Ford Rangers and Tauruses and things like that. Pressure can run as high as 1300 PSI when I'm all the way at lock to lock. It's very, very high pressure. Um, that's problematic for leaks. And we have variable assist steering boxes based on the speed of the vehicle. And so we want lots of power assist when we're trying to park the car and maneuver it in a parking lot, but we don't want so much power assist uh, when we're going fast because we don't want the vehicle to be unstable, things like that. And then when you talk about performance vehicles, we have what we call short turn boxes. And what that means is that when I have the steering wheel, I can do less input at the steering wheel and give me more input at the wheels. Um, and so whereas a modern wheel might be, you know, three or four turns lock to lock all the way around, this one might be a turn and a half. And so they put those on race cars. So if you think of a guy in NASCAR, he's only going like this. He's not doing, you know, this kind of thing, that kind of thing. He's much more controlled or a road race course where you actually turn right and left. Um, having a short turn box is super, super helpful. Okay. Let's continue on. Okay. So next is steering system components. We have conventional recirculating ball steering system that we want to talk about. So a conventional or recirculating ball steering is strong and it's long lasting. Um, they have one of the downsides though, is there's more wearable parts or components. So they are strong and they do last a long time, but there's more wearable components. So when you look down here in the picture of a recirculating system, you can see all of these joints are going to be wearable areas. So We've got a steering box with a worm gear and a sector shaft and a ball nut. So here's the worm gear here, this guy right here. Here's the ball nut here that has teeth that mesh with the sector shaft. And here's the sector shaft. So these are the, the main key components of a recirculating ball steering gear. So this right here, on the bottom of the sector shaft, it bolts to a pitman arm. So you can see the splines here and here on this pitman arm. This guy's going to go through like that and spline together like that. At the top here, this guy's running like this. Let's see if I can show it at a better angle. Like this. So it's actually up like that because the steering column is bolted, bolted on there. And I cut this one off, so that's cut off of the cutoff wheel. But as this thing turns, it moves the sector shaft right and left and I'll move so you can see it. So the so the ball nut here in my this hand is moving this way on the worm shaft and that's moving the sector shaft like this to turn the wheels right and left so those are our key internal components on a um, recirculating ball steering gear system okay so then we have a pitman arm and the pitman arm here is going to go from the bottom of the sector shaft to a center link drag link or relay rod same component three different names center link drag link or relay rod there's another picture it's worth looking at in this one you can see the pitman arms coming down the steering gears behind the frame there and it attaches to a joint here on what's called the center link or drag link or relay rod there's two inner tie rod ends with tie rod adjusting sleeves and outer tie rods there and that would be your conventional um, recirculating ball steering gear system all right. So when you look here, here's a steering column coming down to a pitman arm, and um, sorry, steering column coming down to a to a recirculating ball steering gear, and then your pitman arm coming off and going to some sort of a drag link, and, and then to a steering arm that might be 
cast as one piece with the knuckle, or it might be a bolt-on piece to the knuckle. Most are cast. What's the idler arm? Well, the idler arm's the um, the arm on the opposite side of the car, the passenger side, usually parallel to the pitman arm. And we try and this is supposed to stay in a parallelogram shape, so these two are supposed to move like that. Um, and that steering geometry is important, so when we hit bumps, we don't get what's called bump steer. That's the idler arm. It's just holding the relay rod or center link or drag link up on the passenger side, the pitman arm holding it up on the driver's side. Let's keep going here. And by the way, here's an idler arm right behind me right here. There's an idler arm here off a Chevy truck. Two bolts here that bolts to the frame. And then there's a Zerk fitting on this joint so it's able to pivot back and forth. And then you've got a tie rod right end type or ball joint end with a tapered shaft. The center link goes on and then there's a nut and there's a cotter pin that hold that in place. Okay, let's keep going. So tie rod ends, in inner, inner and outer, are used um, on the outside of, let me grab one here for you, on the outside to steer the vehicle. So here's a tie rod end off a rack, a conventional recirculating ball steering system. Here's one here. The boot's missing on it. There's the lock nut, so you can turn this for adjusting toe. But that's just a ball and socket so that as the knuckle is going down the road, you can get some sort of movement. So, for example, we can get steering movement here. The wheel can rotate out like this, and as the wheel goes up and down, there's a little bit of movement in there to let that steering system work, regardless of the terrain or regardless of the angle at which it's going. So tie rod ends, inner and outer, um, they have a ball and socket. More modern ones are called RBS or rubber bonded sockets where they don't have a greasable Zerk fitting. And what they do is they put the, the ball into the socket and the injection mold, they inject uh, plastic and it's basically in like this synthetic rubber um, state and the ball just moves against that synthetic rubber. Um, Non-serviceable, some think people think it's better. I don't know if they're better, but anyways, tie rod end sleeves and clamps. So here's your tie rod end sleeves for adjusting toe. Here's one right here. So this clamp threads onto the outer tie rod end and threads onto the um, shaft going to the inner tie rod end. And we loosen these clamps and then we can rotate this. This has a right-handed thread and a left-handed thread so that one way it changes the length in between the two tie rod ends and the other way it moves them out. And that's gonna change the angle of the wheels, you know, in or out, toe, or sorry, toe in, toe out, or wherever they're going to be, that would adjust our, our toe and our also what we call our um, um, <laughs> our uh, alignment of the steering wheel, which is uh, what we call our thrust line. So anyways, we'll go on with that later. So a rack and pinion unit is next or an RP steering system. They are lighter, they are compact, more compact, they are less expensive than a um, a steering gear, conventional uh, recirculating ball steering gear system. So they're lighter, they're more compact, they're less expensive. Um, they do have variable power assist racks based on um, vehicle speed. And so when you look down here, you know, again, we're looking at our rack units. There's the, here's one that's kind of taken apart. And here's a complete uh, modern electricity or electrical assist power steering rack. And then over here is kind of our bread and butter, normal hydraulic power assist, complete rack assembly with inner socket and bellows boots and outer tie rod in there. Okay, so we'll just keep going along here. Um, the rack unit is a pinion and a rack. So this is the pinion that's going up to the steering shaft and that thing rolls, that gear rolls on the rack and moves the rack back and forth and that's how we move the two wheels back and forth. The inner sockets are what's underneath this bellows boot down here or underneath this boot right there. And here's an inner socket right here, a typical rack and pinion inner socket. And that little ball and socket is what moves around. This is threaded onto the end of the rack. And this is going out to the outer tie rod end 
you can see it's threaded so we can adjust when we turn this we can adjust toe and by the way you can see here's a really worn out one okay so that thing doesn't want to hold on there at all that you can see the black and blue and the grease is all gone and that thing's just flopping all over the place and um, that's actually fairly common and then the bellows boot is just going to cover our inner socket to keep grease or sorry to keep grease in to keep water and dirt etc out and then finally we got our outer tie rod in as we already held up earlier and that outer tie rod end um, like on one of these guys right here is going to be our connection at our for steering at our steering knuckle okay so a little bit on wear detection first component wear detection and that is rack mount movement so when we talk about a um, where in a, in a rack system this guy's bolted to the frame here and down here and once in a while there's bushings there and once in a while they'll start moving and of course that's problematic with your steering that's one way that we want to look at it and see if it's uh, working right second is the bellows boots they tear and that's super super common that these bellows boots right here will tear and they let water and dirt get into the inner joint the grease goes out and now we've got wear on that inner socket. Steering gear play in the sector shaft, that would be on a recirculating ball. Um, steering gear, we can get play um, on the sector shaft. Um, we get play between these teeth, between these teeth here. We get play in the bearings there. So it's pretty common to have play in a steering gear. Um, tie rod ends, ball and socket, inner and outer. We don't want independent movement. So for example, if we were to take this guy and we've got the knuckle here and we try and pry these this way to see if there's any independent movement, we want the two to move together like that. We don't want them to go like this. Okay. Um, inner sockets on rack and pinion, if we take the tire and we move it like this, we don't want to see any independent play in there. So we don't want to see this guy I don't know if you can see it, but the shaft is actually moving in and out. So what that causes is as you go down the road, steering wheel is kind of vibrating back and forth like that. That can be caused by the inner rack, um, inner socket wear, or an outer tie rod end wear. And wheel, I found wheel, a, a tire wear can cause that as well, but usually it's the inner sockets that are bad. And they are a high failure point. Those bellows boots tend to tear. Um, and then water and dirt gets in there, and then it wears out the inner sockets on that rack and pinion unit. A drag link can give you independent joint movement. In other words, as you're looking at this system here, this one, the joint is actually on the drag link here. It's not on this one. The tie rod end has a ball and socket there, a tie rod ball and socket. So on this drag link, it's got a ball and socket there and a ball and socket there, and both of those can wear out, give us independent movement. And so just again, a lot more components to fail and wear out on a recirculating ball conventional steering system. A pitman arm and an idle arm are wear. And again, we're looking for independent up and down movement. So when we move the tire back and forth, if we see the drag link flopping up or dropping down, we know that there's wear. And the idle arms are very, very uh, notorious for wearing. This pitman arm on the other side is non-wearing where it attached to the sector shaft, but this one does have a ball and socket where it goes to the um, uh, center link, drag link, or relay rod. So on some cars, we have non-wear pitman arms where the ball and socket's actually in the center link, drag link, or relay rod, or this one where it's actually on the pitman arm. So there are two types, wear and non-wear. Here's a non-wear pitman arm right here where it doesn't have a ball and socket on it. So it splines onto the sector shaft, and then over here, the ball and socket from the, the relay rod would come up through. So this is a non-wearing pit arm, and the only reason we would ever replace that is if somehow it got bent in an accident. So methods of wear detection. So we can jack up one tire and move the steering wheel back and forth and observe any independent movements at joints. And by putting one tire on the ground and jacking up the other tire, we can kind of isolate and um, we can isolate our movement. We have both tires up. Sometimes it's a little hard to tell if you have any independent movement. It's pretty easy to tell, though, on a, on a um, rack and pinion. We're just looking for independent movement in that inner that outer tire rod end or independent movement on the inner socket. 
And then, of course, on the recirculating ball, we're looking to see if there's that relay rods moving up or down, or we get independent movement in one of those um, ball and socket joints. So we can put the vehicle on a rack and move the wheel back and forth to observe independent movement. Again, we grab the tire and we move it like this. We kind of jerk it back and forth. And we jerk it, and when I say back and forth, I mean like toe in, toe out kind of a direction. Um, so if we're looking at it like this, we're like we're going like this, like this with the tire. Let me do that again. Two, 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 two. Okay. If we're looking at a top view of the tires, hopefully that makes sense. Okay. So that's all we got, and then we'll look at some things in the shop, and we'll go from there. Thanks so much.